Welcome to How Not to DM. I'm your host, Derek. Thanks for joining me on my quest to interview the very best dungeon masters on this plane of existence. Before we get started, I need to shout out my newest patrons, Robert Walker and Robert Hartley. Thank you both so much. You help make the show possible. If you'd like to support the show, want a shout out on my next episode, or want an inside scoop on my upcoming guests, consider joining. You can find the link in my episode notes, my link tree, or by heading to patreon.com slash hn, the number 2, DM. Remember that 10% of my ad and patron money goes to support local LGBTQ plus youth via Encircle. Check out my link tree for more information. And now, on to this episode's guest announcement. Grant Howitt is a game designer at Rowan, Rook, and Descartes. You've probably heard of at least two of his games, Honey Heist and Goblin Quest, both one-page RPGs that have spread like wildfire across the TTRPG world. He's created tons more where that came from, including dozens of one-page games, and also full tabletop role-playing games with rulebooks, maps, soundtracks, adventures, and more. It takes incredible creativity, skill, and endurance to churn out the games at the pace that Roan, Rook, and Descartes have done over the past few years, and Grant possesses all three. Take a peek inside his talented process, and listen to his best tips for designers and game masters alike. Enjoy! So, my name is Grant Howitt. I am a... How old am I? 35? Yeah, 35 or thereabouts. A year old uh, game designer. Uh, I live and work in London at the moment. And I do this full time for enough money to pay the mortgage, which is lovely. I'm one third of Rowan, Rook and Deckard. And that number is my my percentage is gradually decreasing as we get as we bring on employees, which is very exciting. That is, but, yeah. Uh, my first ever time experiencing tabletop role playing was at the it was so there's a there's an event in the UK called uh, called Games Day which I don't, I'm not sure whether it runs anymore actually I don't think it does but uh, the Games Workshop used to run a sort of yearly expo for their own products and right. so the back in the year 2000 22 years ago I was getting ready to go on a bus to uh, Manchester or Birmingham to go to see Games Day, and we were sleeping in we were sleeping in little sleeping bags above Games Workshop Carlisle, which is in the north of England. Oh, and, in in Cumberland, uh, yeah, I'm yes, indeed, yes, mm-hmm. yeah, wretched place, Carlisle, really, really, really <laughs> terrible place. Very few redeeming features. I lived there for a while. Anyway, I was I, I was there. We were sleeping sleeping over above the Games Workshop, and some boys, some older boys. We're playing a, a this this mysterious thing, this mysterious thing. Because I don't I don't ever really seen Warhammer before, and these guys were playing what I now understand to be a very badly jammed game of Sabbat, which is, a, which is a vampire game, and it was like it was absolutely daft, just like like oh I'm gonna run around, oh, I'm gonna cut a grandma in half with a chainsaw, Woo-hoo! and it was like this just sort of like cringy eye rolling stuff. But to my thirteen oh, year old heart. I think that's yeah. Thirteen. I'm just like, oh my god! They didn't have to make any models. They just they just did whatever they wanted. And they were so cool that they were asked to leave the shop and play in the alley outside because it wasn't an official Games Workshop game. I was enamored and overjoyed. And from there, it was a oh a scant seven years until I started playing regularly because <laughs> all my friends were too cool. Mm. I had to make my I had to power down my friends in high school to the point where they'd play role playing games with me. Slowly chip away, yeah. It, I'm only laughing because uh, I play with my wife right now. She's in one of my games, and uh, it, it did take some convincing to to get her to participate, but it has been good overall. <laughs> That's funny. Okay, so it took a while for you to, to kind of get regularly playing. When you mm. began regularly playing, it sounds like you were the ringleader, so to speak. So were you the one running the games then? Yeah. No one else was really interested in running games because that was difficult. And again, not cool. and didn't involve talking to girls at any point, which we were very big. Like, okay, I was going to say we were very big into. I would have loved to have done it, I presume. I don't know what it... I'm still still entirely sure what it's like. But it was very important to us as 15-year-olds. And I ran... uh, What did I run? The first thing I ever ran was a game called Zaibatsu, 
which is still available online. I believe it's on an Angel Fire website, if oh, you yeah. can imagine such a thing. And it's a very basic 2D6 system, and I played on that and got everything wrong. And then I think the the thing, the, the bit where I realized that this was the, what what I was actually interested in in role playing games was about half uh, halfway through the first session where I was like don't like these rules I'm adding some more and I put in rules for cool points which is that you do something cool and just sort of ignore the rules for a bit and really cool points that's kind of a hallmark of my design that's really sort of stuck around <laughs> for 20 <laughs> years afterwards yeah it is yeah. we played that we played I did manage to get a a regular game going on at school in in lunch breaks, which was a hacked version of Zaibatsu, the game which I referenced earlier, where we all played ourselves, and evil bad guys were running into the school to try and to try and do some evil business. So there was all sorts of just like a madcap shooting, running, jumping game, which was which was really, really silly and fun. We had like eleven players, and they'd come in and drop out. People, thought, oh, I want a character. She did that. So that was fun. And so that was my like. Uh, it was it was fun, but it was never really the main thing I did until I got to university. And then when I got to university, I joined the game society. I went to UEA, which is in Norwich in in the UK, and really that was where I found a bunch of other people who were as nerdy as I am and desperate desperate for someone to to lead them. <laughs> you found your people, yeah. Uh, I. I found a group of people I was uh, who it was mutual, and I was willing to exploit them for political power, and they were willing to not do the job of running the running the society in exchange for me doing it. So, like, fine, okay, great. <laughs> you came to an accord, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, in all of the the years of running various different games, designing your own games, what do you feel like are some of the big mistakes? that you have made that are examples of how not to GM or DM, mm. you know, what, what do you feel like are kind of the, and, and they could be overarching problems. They could be very specific problems, but yeah, share with us some of the things that you've learned. So I've got an example from uh, a little bit later in my, in my life, I'd be about 25, about 10 years ago. And I was running 13th age, which is a really, really good game, which no one's really heard of published by Pelgrin. It kind of fits in between D and D Fourth Ed and Fifth Ed by Jonathan Tweet and uh, Rob Hindsue, and really fantastic game. So I was running an ongoing campaign where I was just sort of getting some monster stats and loosely stitching together some some adventures and some fights. And then I asked my players, "What do you want in the next arc of the campaign?" Done like fights in woods and fights underground, and they were like, "Oh, we'd like some role playing, Grant." I'm like, oh, fine, whatever. So I put together this relationship map for for, for basic, basically a mystery mm. in in the city of somewhere or other, and it was all about like secret cults stealing artifacts from each other, and they had connections to the player characters, and like one of the great things about Thirteenth Age is that it uses these things called icons, and so icons are these sort of like very powerful entities within the world who your characters are involved in or you know have relationships with. So I did this big relationship map, and I sat down and said, like, right, okay, half the party, we're going to go investigate this. And I throw them the hook. I'm like, right, cleric, wizard, you go to visit the, the allied temple, and you see a mysterious cloaked figure running across the rooftops with the stolen relic. And they're like, well, I'm not running across the rooftops, I'm a wizard. Hell with this. And just left it. I was like, oh, um, okay. And so my relationship, my relationship map just starts crystallizing. Meanwhile, the barbarian is like, "I want to go for a drink. What are the bars like around here?" It's like, "Oh, I don't know." One called there's a uh, there's an owl bar, an owl bear wrestling bar. Oh, cool! Yeah, I used to go to these all the time. And so we made up the sport of owl bear <laughs> wrestling, which mainly involves dressing up as an owl bear oh, and I fighting. See. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and because because like, otherwise you spend too much on replacement arms and. Like that stuck with me. Everyone at the table had fun. The barbarian had fun. Everyone got into it because we built this idea together, and that was no work whatsoever. And I think that the the biggest lesson I can give people is all that prep should do is increase your ability to react, because this is a like it is it is a it's a very strange art form. It's a very strange storytelling thing you're doing, where 
your story is it's not even half formed. You have a series of ideas and a series of things like, well, this will work and this won't work. And you have various rules which you can abide by, both spoken and unspoken. But when you plan things out and you're like, right, here's the relationship to this and here's what's happening there. And then basically, if at any point you say, well, when the players do X, I'll Y, stop. Because at that point, write a novel, get out of your system and build a scenario. Build this big toy box full of stuff the players can go in and mess with. Or write down four things you think are interesting. And then wherever the players go, that's where it happens. Nothing like... You can't get it wrong. You can't say, oh, oh, God, you're supposed to go left through here, so oh, the door's in the wrong way, so you can't see that. It doesn't matter. Nothing happens until you speak it aloud at the table, and then after that, you can change it and say you were lying or you know, keep messing with it. And I think the biggest thing that I've learned is planning can help you. It can save you time like in, in terms of like, oh, I'm going to look up, uh, I'm going to put together three fights so I know that these fights will be interesting and balanced and I'm not going to have to spend 10 minutes going through the book. Or I'm going to put together, oh, I've got an idea for these two characters. They'd be interesting. We'll put them together. We'll, like, we'll have them fighting each other. And then you open yourself and you listen to your players. And that is how you have a good time role playing, not by prep, which took me a while. Yeah, time. I think everyone stumbles into that, right? They think, ooh, I'm going to create this elaborate thing and then, like you said, just as soon as people start tugging on all of the threads, it, it starts falling apart and you realize that it was hmm. all worthless and they remember the owlbear wrestling better. So it's... I, I, will, I will say, will say, nothing's worthless. I want to reiterate that. Like, There's a, a principle I have for game design, which is a lot of like really established kitchens have a mother of yeast in them, which is uh, like, a, like an, an open pot of yeast which they use to bake bread, like sourdough bread. And everything that's cooked in the kitchen, no matter what happens to it, those air particles go up and they land in the yeast. So even if you completely burn a meal and have to throw it away, well, it's still yeast. And that's kind of how I view game design and prep and everything and research is like, well, it's all happened. It's all I did. You can reuse that. You can take it apart. You can you can learn from it in mm. some way. So I yeah. like that. Yeah, it's it's true. You You still will learn from it and... Even if they have destroyed half of the the web you designed, you have at least other parts that you can use later at, as story hooks or whatever. So yeah, you're right. You're right. Do you have any particular favorite memories of improvisation, uh, role playing from games that you've run that, that you know people still talk about today, or that that you remember fondly? Well, that's, that's the that's the example I just gave. I think which is kind of the keenest learning example in terms of. Prep versus improv. That's the thing. I I, I always I, I find it really challenging to to sort of recount role playing game stories in that way because it's a story. Improv. It's a story written by amateurs about a group of people who you don't know, and it didn't happen. Mm. And so the stakes are incredibly low. And like so, yeah, I have this. I have this really lovely story about how our cleric of Tiamat in our fourth e, our fourth ed game many years ago decided that he wanted to really defeat the transdimensional owl, who was his main enemy throughout the game. The owl kept appearing and ruining his plans. And so he balled up and burnt his magic trousers around his hand <laughs> to, to like to scour the owl from the multiverse. And the deal was it was like, dude, you understand that like this is this isn't just trousers. What you're burning here is every pair of trousers you could ever own. Your character's going to be trouserless for the rest of the campaign. So I, I don't care. Let's do it. Let's beat this out. And that was really beautiful. And that all happened as a result. I was using... It wasn't 4th Ed. I tell a lie. I was using Everway to run 4th Ed. <laughs> Everway, Everway's kind of like... It's a, it's a Monty Cook okay. sort of tarot card yeah, yeah. game. Diceless. Completely the opposite of 4th Ed. But I'd gotten so bored with the system. I was like, no, no, no. We're going to do it Everway. What, Everway, whatever. And so yeah, and like that for me was a real sort of that was a moment I'll carry around, and like we we do sort of talk about that. But I've I've moved a lot, unfortunately. Oh, I've lived in I think like five cities in my adult life, game with people in all of them, and unfortunately that means that there isn't that sort of hardcore of people who you've been interacting with at the same time. Yeah, multi-dimensional trousers. What what do those do? I've just never mm. heard this term before, and must know. Well. Well, thank you for asking, Derek. They're made out of they're made out of the night yeah. sky. So the cleric still was everyone got a magic item which had no numerical benefit at the start of the game. 
and the clerics was he got a hat and a cloak, and when he turned them inside out, it would look like any hat and any cloak uh-huh. he wanted. And so, and like, and like he took haberdashery as a skill, which we sort of fudged the rules so we could have that. But these, his fabulousness was a big part of it, and he was sort of fighting the owl for control of the celestial wardrobe. A really serious game, yeah. as you can tell. And these trousers were, I think they were just like plus two trousers. It was a set of plus two light armor. But I had them as these beautiful sort of like like nebula trousers, which he then burned in, 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 a, in a dimensional rift to really muller an owl. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. Mm. I love the thought of wearing clothing that looks like the night sky. So, wow. Right? That's so cool. You can get that. That's well, but I mean, like shifting and changing, like it, you know. Ah, oh, right. anyway, th- there are websites. That's true. Maybe I should <laughs> buy myself some. Okay, who do you feel like are your greatest influences on running games, if you have any? Terry Pratchett, in the way that everyone in every Terry Pratchett book is slightly out of their depth, aside from like Veterinari, who's always kind of like, but Veterinari's not, not a main character. Everyone is is about five minutes away from disaster, and I find that the best NPC you can you can run. Uh, you know, I'm exaggerating. Not everyone, but my favorite breed of NPC is someone who's been given a great deal of authority and does not have the capacity to affect the authority. So, like uh, so- someone who's just been sworn in as the captain of the guard. No, like hi. Um- Put your hands in the air and surrender. You're surrounded. And like somewhat like the problem there is ready. Like I like NPCs who can be exploited by the player yeah. characters. And so like I find that really fun. And I find Pratchett's like the way of writing is that everyone was flawed, everyone was human, everyone was trying. And even like even sort of like in D D terms, they're quite competent characters if you think of the watch members like uh, Angua and Carrot, in that they're both like pretty reasonable level fighters with pretty good stats if we're going to get mechanical about it they were culturally impacted they were unable to understand the like social cues and they were very easy to take advantage of in certain ways and i think that was that that's very interesting the other influence would be grant naylor which is a team of two men which is rob grant and doug naylor who wrote red dwarf and I find Red Dwarf is my favorite party or my, my favorite group dynamic show. It is a it is a bottle episode which lasted seven mm. seasons. And the the core idea behind Red Dwarf, unlike it gets fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier, but the core gag behind Red Dwarf is is like it's the last surviving human not getting on with his flatmates in space. And so everyone's reprehensible. Everyone's broken everyone's trying their best and everyone's just like they're, they're like it's a show about forlorn hope and pettiness and like the one thing which i really enjoy is is like having huge stakes and then ignoring those stakes for something so like like lister's trying to get back to earth to try and be like like to, like to, to see if there's still humans alive three million years on and uh his flatmates arguing because he smokes in bed and even though his flatmate is dead and can't feel the smoke, that's brilliant for me. I love that. And so, yeah, those two things I try and I try and build from there. Yeah, I think. Oh, and my and this one GM who I had in uh, I wouldn't say an inspiration, but he was really cool. He ran a Silent Hill campaign for us in university using World of Darkness rules, and he got a he got a, an AM radio and an illegal AM radio transmitter hooked up to his laptop. And you know how in Silent Hill, when there's monsters nearby, there's like radio yeah, yeah. static or like so like something. So we had a radio, we turned it, we tuned it to a channel, and then when we were near monsters, he'd start broadcasting like really messed up staticky laughter of children to the point where like like we started turning <laughs> off the radio. <laughs> but like oh, and like we had we played in a completely pitch dark room with the windows with the curtains drawn, and we were given not enough torches with bad batteries to read our character sheets. I, it was just really, it was really atmospheric. It was really wow. cool, but I don't do that. That's not the way I run yeah. games. I'll turn up and vamp for two and a half hours, and then go to bed. <laughs> that doesn't sound like me. No, but that's Ooh. that's really cool. Actually, that that's commitment to the craft right there. You said some. Oh, the Terry Pratchett characters. It's funny because Ooh. the older I get, the more I realize that everybody is just like 
skating by. They don't really know what they're doing. You know, so-called experts, so-called whatever. You know, people who have absolute confidence or power or skill exist in, in books and movies, but not in the real world. That's funny. It's an incredible observation by him that people are really like that, you know. This episode of How Not to DM is brought to you by Gemmed Firefly. Need a fresh new look for the new year? Head on over to gemmedfirefly.com for the newest tees, mugs, and home goods styled with D&D gamer humor and aesthetics. As always, Gemmed Firefly makes every shirt to order, bringing you all of the softest and most comfortable shirts that thousands have come to love. And now, listeners of the show get a discount when you use the code DRAGON at checkout. Find your new favorite shirt at gemmedfirefly.com. Next sponsor is a new one, Veil of the Void. Veil of the Void is a sci-fi fantasy storyteller's TTRPG designed with a focus on fun. Everything you need to play, GM, and homebrew it is inside one core rulebook. With nine diverse species, 10 unique classes, 30 specializations, and the ability to fully customize your class however you'd like, there's no limit to your creativity or character possibility. If you'd like to learn more or to get your own copy, head to sdgcreatives.com. Also, Trevor, the creator of the game, wanted to share some love with listeners to this show, so use the code HN2DM, that's five characters, for 15% off your purchase at checkout. Thanks, Trevor. Check out the links below for more on Veil of the Void and Gemmed Firefly. And now, let's return to the show, starting up with a brand new minigame for Season 2. This week on Quickfire Chaos, Grant and I are going to use some random generators online and dice rolls to create an idea for a one-page RPG. All right, so just tell me when to stop. Stop. Oh, okay. The theme is addiction. The setting is ancient Rome. <laughs> if you don't like it, we can always do another well, one. We can, but it's, we can work it out. We can work it out. It's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Now the character goal, if you would roll that d10. I've got a five. Okay, become a leader. All right, I've got something roughly around this. So, like, the the idea of ancient Rome, when uh, when we speak, we think of ancient Rome, I like the idea of sort of politicking and uh, internecine conflict between houses and sort of, like, performing for the favor of the emperor. So let's say there's this sort of foppish, useless emperor and you play the senate who are trying to operate around now, yeah. you're trying to become a leader, and we have the theme of addiction. One of my favorite things to do is to confuse magic and drugs. So we are going to going to be... Uh, we're looking at Solomon-style demons, so like King Solomon-grade demons, which are granting power to you and your followers. You'd each play... You'd either play individual members of the Senate who are competing against each other, We'd probably take it to a diceless place and have that as more kind of a microscope back and forth. Oh, who are you going to ally with? Blah, blah, blah. Or yeah, we go yeah. Blades in the Dark style and you're playing this one brand new senator and his three occultist friends who are trying to make their way. Oh. In, so you've in. got one face and then the, the three friends are kind of the influences or the ones that do the dirty work behind the yeah. scenes. And like, yeah, and I, and I think that, that could be fun, like, especially <laughs> if we have the sort of demonic pact thing or like like the, we have the idea of signing a contract which is more powerful than simple, the simple law. The idea that, right, you've divided this senatorship between the four of you. This guy is, is the face, but we are all equally responsible and we are all going to benefit from this. And, and, you know, we've sold our souls to, to whoever we want. I think we've got something interesting there as well, combining, if we're going ancient Rome, that we can go with the we can go with the stolen Greek gods rather than Christianity, and then uh-huh. have the stolen Greek gods versus a, like, paint the Asgoetia as insidious and infectious and simply more powerful and more prevalent to have these demons who can grant you absolute power. And yeah, uh, you play until 
I imagine the culmination would be some sort of we have one like one scene per season, and then it'd be the grand summer games, and you get to have some sort of ancient Roman brutality. There you go. <laughs> there you go. That's a game. Yeah, I was thinking you could uh, you could you would play like rounds where you'd all meet as the senators, and you could like I don't know if you do cards or or dice or something to determine whether or not the things you're trying to go get done get done based mm. on your interactions. And then you've got to come back and, and keep planning. But yeah, I, I love that. That's uh, <laughs> that's that's great. I've never thought about doing like a an ancient political game, but I can't stand historical games. Yeah, because uh, you can get it wrong, and then people come at you. Or well, yeah. so I, I, I played I played in a Vampire the Dark Ages game many uh, moons ago. I, mean, I, was, I, was, I was living in Australia. I played in a Vampire the Dark Ages game, and. We had, uh, I think I was playing a German guy and a couple of other players were playing, like two brother French Jukes. And they were like, around that time, there, were, there was a strong contingent of Jewish people in France. And they were walking up to the to the GM and going, oh, bonjour, we are the French vampires. And one of the other players was like, you know, they didn't sound like that. It doesn't matter. They probably didn't speak with a strong Australian accent either. And like that sort of thing, and the thing with an established setting. I remember, like, this, while we're talking about Discworld, I tried to run a Discworld campaign. I tried to run a Discworld game, and I was like, "Cool, okay." So you go from here to here. One of the players was like, "No, it's not that far." I just like as a GM, you have to have this really wobbly, nebulous world which you can mess with as much as you like. Which is why Spire has, I think, three different canons. Yeah, it's it's true. Uh, that's funny though. It I've never played a historical game either. But I could see why you would get those insufferable people who just would not be fun to play. Okay, so uh, we've talked about how you got into games. We you mentioned Rowan, Rick, and Descartes a little bit. Mm. So tell us, how did you get into designing games? And do you remember the first game you built? The first game I built was it was the game I mentioned earlier. Actually, the one I used to play at lunchtime with my friends. It was called Uncle oh, yeah. Grant's Comedy Role Playing Game. Was the first game because I used to try and distance myself from my peers by called by and as you refer to myself as Uncle Grant. It was very straightforward. It was a terrible game and it had an obsession with marijuana because I was like that. That was the cool thing to do at my school. And so while I think I'd maybe smoked weed like twice, there's at least three pages devoted to it in this 18-page document. But I think the first thing which I did, which I consider grown-up game design or like something which I'm proud of. Is a game called Zombie Larp. It was with Chris Taylor, who is my co-author on Spire and Heart, and he's one another third of Rowan Rick and Deckard. He's the Deckard part. Part of the reason I said earlier that like I, I found a group of nerds like me ready to be led. Part of the reason why I was so keen to get into power on the game society, and then also manipulate events, so Chris got into the games officer and scheduling officer for the game society because we wanted to take over a sports hall overnight at a, a university. Ah. Uh. So we could fill it full of the undead. And like this was just right about the time. So this would be 2007, I think, 2006? 2006. And so Nerf had just discovered how to make Nerf guns cool. They had the Maverick, which is a six-shot revolver. And like massive and outdated and inaccurate, and it jams now. You know, they've, they've got these things that provide basically paintballs without paint them, but whatever. These things were the absolute nuts when they came out. They were amazing. And so we were like, well, we've got to have a game about these. We gotta do something. And so we would get drunk and run about in our halls of residence, pretending to be zombies and shooting each other. And we were like, well, why don't we codify this and charge people two pounds a head to play it? And so, like, the very first thing which I was part of and proud of and excited to be part of was Zombie Lot. And we played, I'd played one evening of, of a World of Darkness live game and got very, very bored. And Chris had played half a morning. Of a traditional like buffer LARP, I guess you'd call it in America, which is like running around in a field hitting each other with pretend oh, sticks. Yeah, I think we would just call it straight up LARP, but like the the foam weapons kind of thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like I think like in like buffer LARP has much more in the way of like oh, it just looks like a big red piece of foam we're gonna hit each other. The weapons yep. looked more authentic here, but it was very much about running around outside and pretending to have fights, which is fun. Anyway, Chris did half the morning of that. He got tremendously bored, and we were like, "Yeah, we can do it," and with the confidence of two 22-year-old white men, we, we just sort of <laughs> rocked up and penned the system, which had, it had an average character lifespan of seven minutes. And 
it was tremendous. It was tremendously good fun because it was really intense. And like you had like the, the resolution system was shoot the bullet at the zombie. And if the bullet hits it, it dies. And we trapped people in this building and chased them around. Like the game didn't start until midnight because, you know, we were young. And everything was very intense and exciting. And that was where I think I learned to, I learned that we can take mechanics and we can take guidance to give players and we can take a scenario to set it up and then just see what happens. Like you build a machine which makes stories happen and then let people run around and mess around in that machine. And Zombie Lot was the, the first part of that. And yeah, I'm very proud of it. Eventually, we managed to run it in a shopping mall. Uh, and yeah. I had, it had an abandoned shopping mall in Reading, which was really, I think, one of the high points of my life. Because I think shopping malls are really cool places. Uh, they just, are, yeah. just like architecturally and like psychologically and the way in which they're set up and their function. But the best thing about malls, which I didn't realize, is if you go underneath them, there's a labyrinth of red lit tunnels which connect all the shops to the storage and to the loading bays. And we just filled them full of the undead and smoke grenades. It was wonderful. So yes, that was the first thing which I'm excited to have been part of, I think. That sounds really cool. When I was in college, there was a game called Zombies vs. Humans. Yes, yes. And during class, it was a safe space, but as soon as the bell rang or whatever, the zombies could come try to attack you, and you had like a bunch of socks in your pockets that you would throw at them to... It's to, pervasive to, in America, isn't it? The, the way they handle it. So it's like, it happens for like a week, doesn't it? Yeah, it was a week, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and they would do like nightly raids and stuff, and, and I never participated, but I did see a lot of, of yeah. it happening. It, anyway, that, that's kind of what it reminds me of. All right, yeah, you mentioned Rowan, Rook, and Deckard. Number mm. one, which which of the three are you? I'm Rook. You're Rook, okay. The, the character names. I figured... Okay, yeah, character name. So how did you all start working together, and how is it going right now? It's good. So me and Chris Taylor and Maz Hamilton, who are the, the three of us who run it, and Maz was also involved in that in Zombie Lab right from the start. They were like they helped with our programming, they helped run our zombies. They were influential in and then and then like setting it up as a business. Maz has brain the size of a planet, which is really useful. And we did that, and then we uh, I, I started writing games semi-professionally when I went, because I was moving around so much I couldn't like legally work in a lot of countries, so I had to sort of pretend I was, I had to sort of operate out of England, but run a Kickstarter or what have you. And it got to the point where we were, Chris and I had written a game together called Unbound, which we recently re- republished in an updated format. We've written a game together. We'd published it on Kickstarter. It'd gone quite well. And we were like, actually, actually, we can make a go of this. Actually, looking at the amount this has brought in, we're good enough at this and we can make it happen. And so, again, mainly Maz, who oversaw a lot of this. We were on a holiday. The three of us were in a swimming pool in the, in the Portuguese countryside during a break. And I think I was smoking a cigarette and drinking white port out of the bottle in a swimming pool. And I was, and Maz was like, we could form a business, you know? It's like, yeah, I guess we could form a business. And that's how Rowan, Rick, and Deckard sort of happened. We like we like our first goal was to get enough money coming in every month that Chris could move out of his parents' place. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good goal. Yeah. And so we've been operating now for I think four years, five years. And really going from strength to strength. It's wonderful. We have like I, I get to write jokes about elves for a living. It's creatively fulfilling to have the opportunity to write all these like all these silly one-page role-playing games, but also do like something which is closer to like groundbreaking stuff in the in uh, like around around the field of role-playing games as art, around things like heart, and to write games about things, to write games that aren't about things, to collaborate with so many interesting artists and designers and writers. It's really a dream come true. I'm so glad that it is that we are earning money from doing it, and long may it continue. Yeah, that's amazing. So Tim Roven, I had him on my show a few, well, I suppose about a month or two ago. I was talking to him about having set something up with you, and he said, this is his quote, Grant is madcap in the best possible way. So what do you think it is about your experiences and personality that make you such a good and creative designer of games? (laughs) What is it about your personality that makes you so good? Well, thank you for asking. (laughs) <laughs> about my personality I, I suffer from a keen social anxiety and also a I'm, I'm an introvert as well um, so I mask it quite well and I do like holding I like holding a crowd I like sort of 
performing on a stage. I haven't had the chance to do that over the last couple of years. But yeah. I I realized that part of the reason, and this is, a, this is a lot of therapy, it's got me to this point, but part of the reason why I enjoy making role-playing games so much and why I enjoy not necessarily running them, but writing them, is because I rely heavily on a list of internalized rules for socializing and sharing mm. public spaces. So like, it is a nightmare for me to get on a bus because I'm like, oh I'm, oh, I'm standing in the wrong place. Oh, no. When should I push the button? Oh, that guy should turn down his phone. I can hear his music. And just like, so like, <laughs> there is, I am hyper vigilant around that and it is exhausting. But it means that basically writing a series of rules for social interaction with my friends gives me an outlet for that. So there's that. I think also the... And again, personality-wise, I try really hard not to care about anything because because I don't want to uh, I, don't, I don't want to get hurt, and that means that my games are often quite short. They're often viewed as quite silly, and they are one shot or explosive or like or like no, no no we're not building something beautiful together. This isn't something which is introspective or intimate. This is big and loud and happening, and we have a laugh and then we move on, and we don't need to think about it or feel anything. And that means that you end up with honey heists and goat crashes and, and sort of like play these agents of anarchy in this really straight laced world. Now, it, and that is my, like, comedically straight laced. That's my, what's the word? Trademark? Copyright? Uh, uh, signature? Yeah, thank you. That's the one. That's my signature. Yeah. Yeah. In, the, in the, you are a bunch of horrible little goblins trying to do something that the grown ups don't want you to do. Yeah, and that's funny. The idea of like not having big like moral lessons or whatever in your games. I I guess I now that you say that I can I can definitely see that. It reminds me a little bit of I'm not sure if you're familiar with Seinfeld the TV show. Oh yes, absolutely. But the uh, producer uh, Larry David at the beginning of the show said, "There's going to be no hugging. There's going to be no learning. There's going to be you know he had like a bunch of rules about how the characters yeah. couldn't like." learn lessons and like get closer together it was just about them being terrible people the whole time mm. so <laughs> that's kind of what it reminds me of i will say i that's been softening and right. so like heart is about dying in the best possible way which is another thing which might be working through in therapy and spire mm. is about hope and about like wouldn't it be nice if your actions could affect the world wouldn't it be nice if you one person could affect the grand machine and so there's a cathartic experience there, and there's a frustration as I grow up, as I get older. My games are brought, like each one is therapy. And the more I write, the more into my head I'm letting the reader. It's not a great place in there quite often, but it is quite funny. So there's that. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. Next couple of questions here are from some of my patrons. First one is What is the secret to fitting a great, memorable, playable game on one page? You only need one rule. Ah, you need one rule, which is the core mechanic, and then anything else you write after that is cruft, and people won't even remember it happens. I cannot understand how people don't get all the rules in Honey Heist. Mm. A majority of the people don't get all the rules in Honey Heist. I'm gonna say it's one. It's one page, and like thirty percent of that page is drawings of bears and hats. It's yep. not complex, but for some reason, people are like right. Okay, that's the mechanic. To hell with the rest of it. And so anything you put on a one-page game, especially if it's small and text-heavy, people might glance at it, but they won't remember it. So you go, you get one mechanic, which can do a lot of heavy lifting, and then rely on the GM. What you can use the sheet for is tables that play well together. So if you have a single D20 table, fine, whatever, and, like, and each player rolls on it once, it's not going to generate a lot of stories. But if you have three D6 tables, which each player's roll on and which mesh together, or if you've got like, right, I've got an adjective and a noun to describe the, the scenario location. With those, you program in a wide variety of possibilities. And part of my job, which my, uh, Joe Dragon actually was talking about this as well, getting lists right is really hard and very easy to do badly. But you need to get lists and tables and like pick lists and the like, which interact with each other and which mesh with each other. And you can like you can get the world building of a of a three hundred page book into something much shorter. I think one of my favorite examples of this is a game called Ghost Echo, 
by John Harper. Definitely a forerunner to Blades in the Dark. Forerunner to Ghost Lines, which was Blades in the Dark's kind of dad. But it's two pages. One page, just a list of cool words. And it communicates this fantastic, intriguing setting to the reader without anything getting in the way. And like it's immediately like, I want to know more. And the only way I can know more is by playing and, make, and, and, and deciding myself. Uh, and that's what you can do with a one-page game. Yeah. Having written one game thus far myself, I thought I was going to do a one-page, and then it took like one page to set the setting. So I will have to take that advice and see what I can do with it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. This is another patron question. Is there a game of yours that's less well-known that you think is deserving of more attention or, you know, that, that you love that people don't seem to latch on to as much? Absolutely. I've got two. So a one-page game, which no one likes and no one plays, is called Adventure Dice. It's a numberless role-playing game. So that there's like I expressly wrote it for kids who are bad at maths, because I was bad at maths when I was a kid. And unfortunately, because I'm quite well-spoken and good at English, people thought I was good at maths. So I used to get put in the advanced math classes, and I had no clue what was going on. But Adventure Dice, you make your own little dice, you print them out and stick them together, and it's basically Apocalypse World, but without any numbers in it. And it has fun custom dice. It's a really interesting and robust storytelling system for for kids or for simple stories, and you can tack things onto it. And it's the least downloaded game on our website. No one's ever heard of it. I think I've only seen it played once by a weirdly high-profile Spanish channel. So yeah. that's one game to look into. The other thing okay. is a game called Havoc Brigade, which I wrote oh, 2014. It's fully illustrated. The core idea of it is you play a you play a group of like spec ops orcs who are going in you know, like who, who are breaking into an imperial city to capture, not kill, an imperial prince, so they can they, they, they can get magic into his brain and work out what what the imperial war plan is. It's madcap. It's very silly. There's like there's a map of the city. The orcs go in, and the idea is that you, like you can't sort of stick around and defeat all the enemies in one area and then move on. It's like you're you're perpetually running through the city. And the goblins, one of the characters is ten goblins. Yeah, the goblins are in disguise as a princess and someone, and like the the mechanic has built a rocket boat, and the shaman is in the zoo trying to marry a pig, and like it's all sort of it all sort of happens, and because of the way in which I refuse to stop abstracting rules everything you do can kind of help so it's just like yeah just just tell tell as many silly stories as there are players and the gm's kind of weaving it together and then you have a conflict in the palace at the end it's fully illustrated it's got a map it's got six pre-gen characters well, 16 if you count all the goblins individually uh you don't and it's it's really good it's lovely and no one's really heard of it or played it and it uses very similar mechanics to goat crashes Mm. Uh, Go Crashes is an evolution of Havoc Brigade. But yeah, yeah, please. It's I think it's free. Or if it's not free, give me money for it. There you go. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I'll have to go check those two out. I have a young one. He's probably not old enough to, to play games just yet, but that's a good call out. Okay, is there a mechanic from one of your games that you love? And is there one from someone else's games that is really interesting to you as well? Absolutely. So from someone else's game? The first uh, thing I want to put forward is Dogs in the Vineyard, which is D. Vincent Baker's game, which he put out before Apocalypse World. And you can tell, sort of like, you can see where he was moving towards it design wise. It's no longer publicly available. Yeah. It has like really strong themes of Mormonism in it. You don't actually play That's... Mormons, but, but you are. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I imagine you're you're pretty deep into that being in Utah. Yeah, huh? in, in Utah, yeah. I actually yeah. have a, a copy of it in my Google Drive. One of these days, I'll get around to playing it. But yeah, that's the thing. Like, it's parts of it seem a little bit sort of inexact now. When you, like when you look at the experience of playing Apocalypse World and what that core system has moved on to, but it has the most beautiful way of handling escalation in a role playing game. It works on poker rules, so like you put together matching dice. And if you don't have matching dice, then that's that's less good and you can take damage. So you roll like two pulls of dice from two stats you put together, and that's your sort of basic innate ability. And you're like, cool. And 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 also I have a really impressive coat. Let's say I'm gonna try and convince this guy to stop beating his wife and leave town, which is kind of the kind of what the game's about, a lot of it. Your law keepers kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. Also, you're 16 years old, you're virgins, and this is your first time away from home. And you are you operate on Judge Dread rules. Fascinating. 
judge, jury, and executioner kind of thing. Yeah, and there's no scripture to refer to, so there's no right and wrong. So you like roll my dice, and I get X, Y, Z. And like the guy's like, oh, I'm, I'm married. Oh, this is my house. I deserve to stay. And he rolls his dice, and you start pairing. And you're like, oh, actually, he's got bigger numbers than me. I have to back off unless I hit the guy. And you roll your hitting dice. And then, right, cool, okay, well, he's hitting you too. And it always escalates to the point where you, you can escalate at the point where you pull a gun. And you start adding D10s to your pool. It's the most powerful thing you can do in the game. But once a gun comes out, you can die. Mm -hmm. And it's just this really wonderful expression of these desperate people being asked to do things they don't understand how to do. And there's no authority but themselves. And in terms of like, well, well how bad do you want to win this up? It's, it's the only game where, like, in the, in the final scene, where we were sort of arguing over, I think it was pretty close. I think it was like a, it was like a miscarriage or spousal abuse or some sort of fun, fun topic. The final climax of the scene of the game, which took two days to play, one of the other cowboys shot me, shot the guy, and then healed me. And like it was like it's that level of intensity. Like I'm, I'm, I'm going to mortally wound you and then bring you back from the dead because I need to, I need to do, to do this. And so, yeah, Dogs in the Vineyard does this really beautiful level of escalation, and I really admire it. Yeah, you can find a PDF online. You will have to steal it, unfortunately, but Baker's left you no other option. And if you can get if you can get a hard copy, it's a really lovely little like one step up from Zine book. It's this lovely little thing. It's got some really good ideas in it. From my own games, we're just now fulfilling on a Kickstarter we ran last year for a source book for Spire, and the Magister's Guide is the GM guide for for Spire. And I was writing this GM guide, and I realized that I didn't know a great deal about GMing Spire, and there's not a lot to say. And it's not like we can do different hit points for kinds of door. It's not like Dungeons and Dragons. So what I ended up doing was pivoting to having like, hey, here's extra, here's extra material for every class. And one of our classes is the Inksmith, who is a film noir magician in an 1850s tech level. So they're slightly anachronistic and out of time. One of the pieces of equipment they can get is Chekhov's gun which you mount above the mantelpiece, and instead of rolling for damage for it, every session, which it's referred to but not fired, it does four damage when it's fired. <laughs> so you have to keep sort of pointing at it and say, ah, yes, my father's gun, and then move on. And then like in session six, you can blow the side of a tank with it. <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. So I'm happy with that. And it's like, it's a bit, it's a bit meme-y, but it's, um, it's fun, and I think we need to have more fun in role-playing games. We do. All right. Any current or upcoming projects with Rowan, Rick, and Deckard or Solo that you're excited about? Yeah, so I do everything with Rowan, Rick, and Deckard, I should stress. Mm -hmm. like Mainly for tax purposes, because in this capitalist hell society we've made, it's much more efficient to have a business than it is to just be a person. Which is exhausting, yep. but we've done that. At the moment, we just finished our Kickstarter for Orkborg last week. Ah, uh, yes, the Morkborg supplement, yep. Which is about space orcs from 40k, but shh, don't talk against my shop. It's, it's, it's awk with a C, not with a K, so they can't, they can't right. touch us. <laughs> we just finished that, which was which is tremendous fun, and I'm doing a dungeon based on Red Dwarf, actually, where a red space dwarf ship crashes into the side of the space hulk you're on and starts cutting it in half with its mining lasers, and so you have to try and stop that, which is fun. I should be ready for distribution by May. Again, Sin, which is the source book we're doing for, for Spire, that's coming out in physical soon as well, once we can get everything sorted. And a bunch of additional splat books. Oh, in fact, actually, tell you what, tell you what, I'm going to promote one thing, which is the conspiracy kit for Spire. And I don't like GM screens. I think they're a bit boring. I know a lot of people do like GM screens, and that's fine, but I like sitting down and having an open conversation with my players. Fine, whatever. And also, I have no notes to hide because I didn't make any. However, I have a lot of people asking for a GM screen, and we're like, well, we might as well publish one. We can get some nice art for it. We can put some clever things in the back. And sometimes GM kits come with a little booklet which goes in them, which has like a scenario or like some quick rules or a rules reference or something. And I was like, well, I want this to be good. So actually what I'm going to do is write <laughs> write a 60-page uh, a rules booklet, A4, which has 12 NPCs and six places. And each NPC has a picture. And then basically, as I was talking earlier about different tables, Eight different tables, which you mash together to give them a series of exploitable flaws and loved ones mm. that you can threaten, and then a way of weaving them together in, into a conspiracy, which you're supposed to take over. And then the front of the jam screen doubles as one of those sort of red string murder boards that lunatics make. 
<laughs> yes, yes. And and it fits in fiction. And so we're doing that. And so if you want a like if you just want some interesting ways to do NPCs and to look at how to build a campaign, buy that off us. <laughs> I love it. All right. Parting words of encouragement to budding game designers and GMs out there. I've got one thing which I say quite a lot. I'm going to reiterate it here. If it says aspiring game designer in your Twitter bio, take out aspiring Mm. once you've published a game. And it has never been easier to publish a game than it is now. There are so many avenues available to you. There are so and like it doesn't have to be popular. You don't even doesn't have to doesn't even have to be good. Just say game designer. And then whatever. Because the only person who's benefiting from you putting aspiring game designer in there is your rivals and people who you don't want to be friends with anyway. You are a game designer. You design games. Go do it. Embrace that and have fun. I love it. Where can people find you and your work online? You go to rrdgames.com, which is the shorter and easier version of rowanrookanddeckard.com. You can see everything we've written together and all of our one-page games. I think we're up to about 65 one-page games now. They're all pay what you want. And most of them are all right. We've got, yeah, all sorts on there. And if you go if on Twitter, you can follow me at GSHowitt. That's G-S-H-O-W-I-T-T, which is mainly pictures of toy soldiers that I build because that's what I do when I'm not writing role-playing games. I relax. I'm getting to scratch building, so I've been making my own soldiers out of putty mm. and plastic cards, which is very difficult and very rewarding. But also, like I do previews on there. I tweet about all my new games. And once I lose this pandemic weight, we'll be back under the selfie regime, I'm sure. <laughs> Nice, nice. Well, thank you so much, Grant, for joining me. It's been a lot of fun talking to you about about games, about designing, about all of your work. And yeah, I think a lot of people are going to find value in it. So I Wonderful. really appreciate it. No worries. I'm glad, I'm, I'm glad, I, can, glad I can help. Godspeed, future generation. Ad Astra. Thank you for listening to How Not to DM. Now it's time for a sneak peek into next week's guest, Matt of Roleplay Chat, another awesome TTRPG podcast. Try to spice it up. Try to introduce something new. I think that that's important, and it's okay to fail. Your players, they can know you failed. You can tell them, hey, I tried this. It didn't really work the way I thought it would. Let's try something else next time. But I think there's a way to fail. There's a way to make mistakes. And it's not by doing too many. To hear more tips and tricks and about how Matt got into TTRPGs and the podcasting space, tune in next week. Remember to check out my Patreon if you haven't already for even more sneak peeks. Next time you get the chance, share this episode with your friends and family around your game table. Another great way to help me boost the show is by leaving a review on Apple Podcasts or by rating the show on Spotify. I appreciate all of you for helping me grow. Thanks to the team at T4C Studios for helping edit and produce this episode. My new intro and outro music is by Daniel Zombo. The Quickfire Chaos music is by Exacat, and the Quickfire Chaos mood music is by Arcane Anthems. Check out the episode notes for more of their great work. And, as always, until next time, roll some nat 20s for me.